It's great to see everybody out here this evening. Um, my name is Scott Taylor. I'm the director of the African Studies Program at Georgetown University. Um, sorry for that echo. Uh, thanks for coming this evening. Um, I was honored to be asked to um, call this event to order and to welcome you uh, and to introduce our speakers. Uh, and in particular, I am I'm particularly delighted to hear uh, the discussion between um, tonight about navigating change in African art, a particularly compelling theme, a hot topic uh, among Africanists today. Still got a bit of an echo. Um, tonight's spe featured spe speakers are here to consider the dramatically changing aspects of the field of African art. Um, and beyond tonight's discussion, uh, this evening is just the start of a series of conversations shared between the National Museum of African Art and the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Um, and uh, so that looks forward to continuing um, over several sessions, both here in Washington, D.C. and in the U.K. Allow me to thank and present three individuals. And forgive me again for this back echo there. Um, first, Nizam Udin who will talk briefly about the partnership between SOAS and the National Museum of African Art. Nizam Udin is a trustee on the board of this, for the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He received his bachelor's degree in economics and politics from SOAS, during which time he was elected president of the University of London Students' Union. He received his master's degree in public policy from King's College London. Uh, his career has been dedicated towards addressing the challenges faced by minority communities. He has helped us to establish the Patchwork Foundation, an organization devoted to improving the political representation of underrepresented groups in the United Kingdom. Mr. Udin is a member of the Mayor of London's Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion Advisory Group. He is also Senior Head of Mosaic and Community Integration at the Prince's Trust, a group founded by the Prince of Wales to help young people from disadvantaged Muslim communities. In 2019, he was awarded a Yale Greenberg World Fellowship in order to fulfill his, further his social activism. Um, and I can confirm that because he gave me a business card that had Yale on it. And following Nizam, we will hear from the director of the museum for uh, a few minutes to in order to address what's going on uh, around us, specifically here at the museum, and explain the sheetrock and <laughs> look forward to that. Um, and many of you, of course, I think all of you know Dr. Augustus Gus Casely Hayford, who joined the museum in February 2018. Uh, his background features a breadth, a wealth of and depth of experience in writing, lecturing, broadcasting um, on Africa's arts and cultures. He is a frequent on air contributor about Africa. Uh, presenting Tate Britain's Great British Walks series for Sky Arts two series on the Lost Kingdoms of Africa for the BBC, um, and a variety of other venues. He has delivered uh, a TED Global Talk on pre-colonial Africa, and is the author of the book Timbuktu, part of the Lady Bird Expert series. Dr. Casely Hayford was educated at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, at University of London, where he received his doctorate in his African history, was later awarded an honorary fellowship. He remains a SOAS research associate and is a member of its Center uh, of African Studies Council. Then joining Gus in the larger conversation about this evening's topic will be the event's featured guest, Dr. Kwame Anthony Appiah, renowned British Ghanaian philo philosopher, prolific author, and scholar. He received his bachelor's degree in philosophy from Cambridge University, spent initial years teaching at the University of Ghana before returning to graduate school and receiving his PhD in philosophy from Cambridge. Since 2014, Professor Appiah has served as professor of philosophy and law at New York University, teaching both at uh, New York, the NYU's New York campus and the campus in Abu Dhabi. Professor Appiah's published works, which have been translated into over 15 languages, focus on cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism identity, ethics, and African and African-American culture. From 2012 to 2018, he served on the advisory board of the National Museum of African Art. 
just as he began his time with the museum, Professor Appiah was, was presented with the National Humanities Medal in 2012 by President Obama for his, quote, contributions to philosophy and pursuit of truth in the contemporary world. His most recent book, The Lies That Bind, Rethinking Identity, was released in 2018, uh, became a, a, a bestseller, a Washington Post notable book of the year, and the New York, one the New York Times book review described as fresh, even beautiful, stating, we need more thinkers as wise as Apia. <laughs> I second that notion. So let me just welcome first uh, my friend and colleague, Nazim Udi. Good evening. Um, it's refreshing. That's the last American accent you're going to hear this evening. It, 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 get, <laughs> it gets British from now on. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome you all um, to this wonderful institution tonight uh, for what promised to be an incredible conversation on navigating change in African art. Um, I'm Nizam Muddin. Um, uh, I am representing SAWAS here. Uh, formally, um, I have moved uh, temporarily to the East Coast. Um, uh, I am here representing both SOAS and Baroness Valerie Amos, who is our director. She regrets that she's not able uh, to be here. Uh, she sends her apologies. We had a trustees meeting today. I'm a very bad trustee. Uh, I missed the meeting, but uh, it's one of the reasons why she couldn't be here today. Um, one of the things I do for my day job, um, as has been mentioned, is I run something on behalf of the Prince of Wales um, in the UK, and it very much focuses on building social integration and building harmonious societies in the UK and increasingly um, internationally. And what's remarkable to me is the work I've been doing recently and the role of arts, the role of identities. Uh, if you haven't listened to the 2016 Reef Lectures by uh, I, you have to. It's a must. It formed my thinking around the work that I do now. And it's also why I want to really talk about why this partnership between our institutions around the theme of contemporary African art is so important. In terms of the, the relationship, it's going to include many things, including an exciting series of conversations uh, that starts here today in February 2020. It will be in London, so you'll have to come uh, along. Uh, we are open. Uh, we, we promise you, despite the conversations, we're not quite resited yet. Uh, so you're very, very welcome. Um, but I want to take a moment to highlight the sig significance of such a partnership. And my organizations like the Smithsonian and this National Museum of African Art and SOAS and the role we have to play in terms of being more proactive in bridging, a, uh, playing a bridging role in a world of increasing division and misunderstanding. It's at the heart of what I do. It's at the heart of why I'm here at, um, on the East Coast looking at how we can build a stronger world. We are uniquely placed to use the medium of art to help make cultures and peoples accessible to not only strangers to a continent and its diaspora, but also to those diaspora communities themselves. It's at the heart of what I do in the UK. I work with minority communities. I spend a lot of time across America working with minority communities, and there is a clear identity crisis that is ongoing, uh, exacerbated by this information age that we live in, and the role of art in humanizing those cultures and those places is crucially important. Um, it's interesting. I wasn't going to share this, but I, I remember SOAS helped me. I, I, I fell in love with a Sudanese girl. Um, and where, this is going in a bad direction, and, and I, really wanted to, I really wanted to impress her. And if it wasn't for SOAS, my, my absolute passion now is for Ibrahim El Salahi, who's a Sudanese artist. I, follow, I followed his work for a long time, and he really allowed me to open into myself and also into the continent. And if it wasn't for the institution of SOAS and this failed love, um, I, I, I would not have had that opportunity. And what's really amazing for me now, one of the things I'm studying at Yale, I get to audit classes, is actually looking at African reconciliation narratives. So we're focusing on Rwanda, on Nigeria, on South Africa, and looking at what, how and what happened and took place to build communities in terms of reconciliation. And the role of art is something which I hadn't appreciated. That's something over the last month I've been really looking at. And what's fascinating is when we talk about Africa, the Middle East, or Asia, it's always a one-way transfer of knowledge. And actually, where Europe and the West is headed, there's a ton of things that we can take the other way. And that's something which I really want to 
uh, promote. So we're delighted as SOAS to begin the series this evening with a leading intellectual and scholar, Anthony Kwame Apia, in conversation with uh, Gus, who we've heard about, who's also an honorary SOAS alum. So I'm going to be very, very uh, brief and thank Gus and his team for putting this on. Um, we're going to be continuing the conversation uh, in London in February 2020. We hope you'll be able to attend. Um, if you are part of the SOAS community, you are very welcome. If you're not, you're also very welcome. Um, and I look forward to meeting many of you uh, later this evening. So I'll hand over to Gus and to Kwame. Thank you so much. I'm just going to be very brief. I just want to uh, say how welcome you are. It's just so wonderful to see so many people that um, I love and respect in this one place. And also to come here at this moment as we go through a period of change. I mean, this is a conversation that is dedicated to thinking about navigating change. And we are, as an institution, going through a period of change. And I can't think of anyone more perfect than our dear friend, Anthony, Kwame Anthony Appiah, you know, one of the most generous and um, interesting people that I have ever met, but I think also the perfect person to help us to navigate some of these themes, themes. but also the perfect person, I think, to help us in this inaugural event to celebrate our partnership, SOAS and NAMAFA. It's a partnership which I am so delighted that we have brokered. I am so proud of my past at SOAS, and I am so proud that we have managed to broker this partnership, and we are going to do wonderful things together. Thank you so much, Nizam, Angelica, in her absence, Baroness Amos as well, for making this possible, and all our other colleagues from SOAS. You've been magnificent partners, and Thank you for helping us to bring this program into being. And our remits, I think about SOAS and the MAFA, our remits, our ambition, our underpinning beliefs and cultures are so beautifully aligned. And between us, we cover two-thirds of the world's geography, 80% of its global population, but also in my mind, we are about its future, the catalyst for critical future economic growth, for human invention, for cultural dynamism. And anyone who visits global art fairs would have seen African artists who were, within very recent memory, contained on the very margins of, of art reporting and commercial attention. But now they're celebrated as being absolutely key figures in contemporary art. And so it's so exciting, I think, this time, this place, this community of people to come together to think about navigating the future. And you are so welcome. And you gather here as we reopen this pavilion. We're beginning, we're two thirds of the way through the refurbishment of it. Um, and it's actually the first time since this building was finished, that it's had such a major renovation. I'll just tell you a little bit about what you will see if you come back in a few weeks when it is complete. Along this wall at the back here will be an installation by one of my favorite contemporary uh, artists, Elias Sime, an Ethiopian artist who is doing absolutely wonderful things with found objects. He began his practice working with plastic bottles and buttons that he found in the markets around Addis Ababa. But he repurposed that rubbish in such beautiful ways and made a kind of new practice that is stunning, not just in terms of its looks, but also in what it says about contemporary Africa. And he has now moved on, and most of his practice is, is inspired and uses circuit boards, motherboards from computers, pieces of computers. And he fashions them into what look like maps, beautiful maps 
relief maps that seem to chart a new moment for Africa and its relation to the re relationship to the world. I mean, these are amazing things that he f would find in these markets. But if you think they probably originated much of their original form as um, um, in terms of materially would have probably have come from Africa. They would have traveled to other parts of the world to be fashioned into new technologies and then come back in a way as rubbish, potentially to be repurposed, but he has found ways of refashioning them into beautiful maps, helping us navigate this complex period. And that is what we want to discuss today, how we navigate this complex moment and think about our futures. And in this space, we want to reinvent a sense of what it will be like to be in a museum space. That we want, as we go forward in a few weeks, if you come back, here there will be large touch tables which will give us an opportunity to navigate our collection digitally. In those two cases at the end, we will have some of the highlights from our collection. And against that wall, we will also have a screen which will hopefully bring voices from across the world into this space in events like this one today. That we are all about navigation, both of our histories but also of our future. And I cannot think of anyone better to be here today as this space, as this institution goes through a transformation inspired by the idea of navigation to help us think about that very theme. I'm so delighted to invite up to the stage Anthony Kwame Appiah. Absolutely thrilling to have you here. I'm delighted to be here. You are, nice to you are such a hero of mine, someone who shares some aspects of a genealogical history that we are both of Ghanaian descent. And uh, it is wonderful to, to, to have you here. And in this space that you have dedicated quite a bit of time to, because you are someone who's been on the board here, yeah. an advisor, a friend. I mean, you, you obviously have a love of African art, do you collect? Um, I wouldn't call what I have anything as grand as a collection. <laughs> uh, I do have some things that I value very much from a great variety of places. And actually, um, the one thing I would say about the art that's in our homes is that it's from everywhere. Really? So we have, we just, we've just uh, been joined by, uh, by, by a Buddha, a Chinese Buddha. Um, we have uh, a wonderful Romanian painting from the 30s of a peasant woman knitting. Uh, we have, of course, because of where I come from, we have gold weights and we have uh, Aquaba figures and uh, figures from um, Congo and some Yoruba stuff. I have a Yoruba brother-in-law, uh, so <laughs> I have access to the secrets of Nigeria, and so on. So, um, so I, I, I mean, I, I, I would say I learned about all this in Kumasi in Ghana where I grew up because my mother was a major collector of, of Asante art and uh, gold weights in particular. And also with um, Alex Chermatin, who should be better known than he is, who was one of the people who uh, really was the driving intellectual force behind the cultural center in Kumasi. Um, who was, as it happens, also our neighbor when we were growing up. Uh, and so I grew up with his kids. But um, so, yeah, I grew up in a household where my mother was um, constantly being visited by mostly Hausa-speaking traders who were going into the villages and bringing stuff out. And she was only interested in the gold weights, as they soon discovered. So they didn't bother to bring anything else after a while. And she would, um, she would discuss them with them. She would not just buy things that she liked and buy collections, she would say, you know, where does this come from, and so on. And um, as a result of all of that, she eventually published some work about these things. And the main thing she did was to collect the proverbs that are associated with the gold weights. I'm sorry, yes. I don't have my back to you. Um, the proverbs associated with the gold weights. So she and I 
published um, seven and a half thousand proverbs in my wow. father's tree language, uh, in tree, and then in, we translated them, uh, with the, also with some help uh, from somebody who's actually from the family of the um, of the linguists of the King of Asante. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so we certainly grew up in our household. And I should say as well that my mother was very much involved. So. Um, the, there's an art department at the university in Kumasi, and uh, one of whose alumni is El Anatsui. Oh, really? And my mother used to go to the annual, um, my mother, who had been to art school herself in England and in Florence, um, w went to the annual shows. So we had some contemporary, um, contemporary that is, in the 60s and 70s, contemporary paintings and so on that she caught at those things. I don't remember, she used to take me, I don't remember seeing, unfortunately, I don't remember seeing Ellen at Sui's show, uh, his first show when he was graduating. Uh, and if I'd known what was going to happen, I certainly would have made sure to <laughs> <laughs> invest in him uh, at an early stage. But, um, so yeah, we grew up caring about these things. Uh, and living, living with art. Living with art, yes. I mean, has that sort of, do you think that's informed what you've done, what you've become, your attitude to it? I mean, just having... I, I, think, I think you can't but be shaped by... And as I say, the, the, I mean, our, 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 what we have comes from all over the place, but so did what we had in Ghana come from all over the place. Yes. Um, the most... Um, I guess the most kind of collectible thing in, in global terms that we had was a painting by Augustus John of a Jamaican which my grandfather bought from Morton John in the 1930s. Uh, so it had been in the family since, since it left the hands of the painter. Uh, and I think it's one of his best paintings, not just because I own it now, but because, because um, in that period when he was in Jamaica for, uh, I think, six months to a year, he did some fabulous paintings. And um, uh, there's a wonderful painting that he did in that period of three Jamaican women, which I think is in, in one of the public museums in the Midlands. Um, and we went to see an Augustus John show in Salisbury this summer, which also had some things. And that's why I, s I can say that I think our painting is one of the best, because <laughs> I enjoyed the show, but I thought, hmm, we got, well, you got something that's at least as good as most of this. So um, we didn't just grow up. And we had Chinese. Uh, my mother had traveled in China when she was young, and uh, in Russian, because my mother, my grandfather had been, had been the British ambassador in Moscow. So we, we had stuff from lots of places. And the way you talk about art is, the way that it, it is the thing that I love about it. It is, for me, kind of very evocative of memories that I have of aunts unraveling wonderful cloths and telling me stories. And the interpretation of that work was utterly fluid. On different days, it would be different. And that, but it was about the way in which art could bind us together, yeah. irrespective of where we were, right. we felt we had a sense of being connected to something mm. that was rooted in yes. in in Ghana. Yes, and no, I, I think the place that sense. So we loved this center that Dr. Terry Martin uh, was the inspirer of, because it was it was uh, it was made by the people of Kumasi. Yes, <laughs> and 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 it had it had dance classes, it had carving classes. Uh, you could watch people making gold weights. You could watch people weaving kente. Um, there were just parties at weekends <laughs> when, when young people would come and dance. And in the middle of it was a small museum which contained, among other things, um, some of the legacy, the, the material legacy, of uh, Akonfwa Noche, who was the priest who yes. co-created Asante with the first king of Asante, uh, Asante to the first. So, um, it was kind of ours in a deep way. Uh, it, it also housed the local branch of the National Archives. So <laughs> it had, you know, it had uh, uh, print material and, and uh, non-print material. A and it had a gallery where paintings and sculpture were shown uh, and so on. And it was, so it was, and it was, you know, just across the valley from, from our house. You could get there in 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> and. So, so we grew up going there very often, and um, I think uh, certainly for me, I can't imagine a life in which um, I can't imagine a life without museums. I think. And it's not just museums because a confo noche is this figure who 
drives the idea of, of narrative being yeah. critical to community. Yeah. And you say that where you grew up, it wasn't just that there was amazing art and material culture around you, but there was also an archive. It's yes. about narrative, about interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that is the thing that great museums do, is that it's not just the art, it's also about the ways in which we animate that through right. consideration, through interpretation. Right. I mean, I think, so um, one of the great things about interesting artworks is that um, you never, you can't say everything there is to be said about them. Yes. <laughs> they can always be interpreted, reinterpreted, placed in uh, side by side with, with different companions, uh, which then lead you to think about them in, in different ways. And I think the other thing is, each of us is free to do our own interpreting. Um, uh, you know, there's all, uh, the, uh, there's every kind of museum. There's museums that provide you with huge amounts of contextualizing information. Um, and, and then there's museums that just put something in front of you and say, look at this. Yes. And these are both uh, important things. I mean, I think it's important to get people to grasp that, um, uh, what is sometimes condescendingly called connoisseurship is actually important because one constraint on sensible interpretations of works of art or indeed of cultural artifacts more generally is that you shouldn't say things that depend upon falsehoods. You shouldn't, you shouldn't say, oh, that's a nice smile, if in fact what it is is, is um, uh, well, I was going to the other way around. Downstairs in this building, there's a thing with the foul teeth uh, of a woman. She's, um, uh, that looks fierce, apparently, to, um, to, to the Europeans who started looking <laughs> at it. But that's because, but they're filed like that because that's a model of beauty in that culture. She's not fierce, she's beautiful. Yes. Uh, well, so you've got to get that right. You can't just make up anything you like. Uh, but still, even if you know everything that's to be known about an object, th there are things to be said yes. that haven't been said. Uh, and, and so I think that, that, that sort of inexhaustibility uh, is I think what I, it's particularly of things that, the things we think of as great works of art, they have that kind of inexhaustibility. You want to keep saying things about them. You, you want to keep thinking about them. They prompt you to have interesting um, ideas. And, and that's, you know, and that's why we go, at least that's why I go, to, to, to art galleries and museums, is because these objects invite yes. uh, you to use your brain uh, and your heart. Yes, and, and I think it's that, it's that very drive that I think is at the core of the transformation that we want to make in this institution. And so with, in us reconsidering this space, it is all about allowing people, whether they actually attend or whether they don't, but to in some way be engaged in the conversations yeah. that happen here. And I think that's one of the, the reasons why Elias Sime, who creates these amazing maps that are about a kind of clash of multiple different narratives that seems to be very much part of contemporary Africa as it, as it navigates this period of incredible change. And one, you do get a sense that African artists are grasping these complexities in a way that few other, few, few other artists you know, are doing with equivalent um, um, I don't know, it, it, just the, the level of analysis and thought mm -hmm. I just think is pretty much incomparable. I think of Ella Natsui, I think of, um, you know, of Yinka Shonabare, people who are helping us to think about where we sit today and the relationship to the past and the responsibility to, to, to narrative. I mean, I think it's maybe not so surprising, I mean, because it's such an interesting situation at the moment if you're an artist from or in Africa. Yes. Um, finally, there's people paying proper attention. Yes. But you've been paying attention to the arts of the world all along. <laughs> I mean, well, the people who taught at El, El Anatsui at, in Kumasi, some of them were Ghanaians, but they were Russians and British and French and all kinds of people. And they, um, so that the, the young artists who were trained there, they already, they knew the, as it were, the world's repertory, yes. and, uh, and they could decide what to do with it. They could, they could ignore it, they could do something with it, and yes. usually what they did was, um, was take, you know, use it, but in a way shaped by 
their own particular background and traditions, as you know, like Anatsui's echoing of the of the Kente tradition, for example. Yes. Um, but the things he's using to make it, well, the bottle tops weren't invented in in Nigeria. They were yeah. made in Nigeria, but the, uh, those bottle tops were invented uh, by people like the Heineken brothers, <laughs> <laughs> who invented bottled beer. So, um, so I think that sense of I mean, I think certainly I grew up very much with the feeling that we were, um, we were uh, very conscious of the wider world. Mm. Uh, wh when I was a kid, um, for example, uh, because of Pan-Africanism, we got to, so uh, Richard Wright visited us when I was a child uh, as part of the circulation of African-Americans through the, through, through, uh, to Africa that was, was invited by Nkrumah, basically. And he wrote Black Power, an amazing, uh, strange book uh, about that period. Um, um, C.L.R. James came by, uh, again, you know, West Indian. Um, so I think, um, but also um, people came from India yes. and Russia. Uh, and so on. We knew people from, the, from, from everywhere, and, and, and we were interested in what they were doing, even if they weren't, I mean, the, the ones who came to us were obviously interested in us, but, but even if most Americans and most Russians and most Chinese and most Indians weren't interested in what we were doing, we were interested in what they were doing. We, were, we had a kind of cosmopolitan attention, and, and I think that shaped, that's obviously shaped um, poetry and novels yes. and, and, the, and the plastic arts of, of places like Ghana a great yeah. deal. Um, and it's that. Now, this is, I think, it's worth pointing out that this is completely normal for how the arts work. Yes. Right? I mean, uh, take, take the non-English things out of Shakespeare and see how far you can get. Hmm. Um, no Danish princes, no Roman noblemen, Yes. That gets rid of Julius Caesar, Menenius, yes. and yes. uh, Coriolanus, and so on. Yes. Or, or take, take Basho, the great, arguably the greatest Japanese poet, at least yes. historically. He, he, he writes in Japanese, of course, but the, he uses a Chinese script. And, uh, because he has to, because that's, that's, that's the borrowed script. And he's a Buddhist. The Buddha wasn't Japanese. The Buddha was, was, uh, was an Indian, or what we now we think of as an Indian. So. Um, so art is like that. Uh, the, the, the poetry and literature are like that. Uh, uh, the sort of creativity that you see, that great explosion of creativity in European modernism in the early 20th century, that was about, as Picasso didn't say, but is often said to have said, uh, stealing from everywhere. Yes. Um, so I think that's normal, and I think that uh, for African artists, it was wonderful to be in that period when you were learning about uh, you could learn about the, the world's great traditions, but also feel free to draw on what you had distinctively to consider, to, to, to contribute. And I think that's the, you know, the great cosmopolitan thought is we are going to be profoundly enriched if we interact with the civilizations of elsewhere, mm. but that's because we have a civilization to bring. Right? It's, it's the interaction. We're not going out there because we have nothing. We're going out there precisely because we have something to offer in exchange. But because there hasn't always been an equality with which we've to put it mildly. been able to bring yes. our culture to the wider world, that it has left a great deal of misunderstanding. But also, additionally, if one travels in Africa and you look at the the state of museums and, yeah. and the way in which valuable, wonderful historical narrative is neglected, that it's heartbreaking. And, you know, that does impact things and that it is in part legacies of colonialism that have left us with, you know, with, with some of this and we have to find ways of dealing with that. Right. I mean, that's completely right. Um, the, the, this very exciting cultural center that, yes. that, grew up, that I grew up with, it was, it was being created as I was a kid, um, is, is a little bit run down now. It's not as exciting as it was. It, obviously, the enterprise of creating it was more 
exciting than the enterprise of maintaining it. That's always true with these sorts of things. But, um, and, and um, there is an interesting question about uh, what the audience is in uh, a city like Kumasi or Accra or, or Dakar. What, what the audience is for what? What, what, would they, what would young people in Accra want to see? Uh, and I think um, they, they, uh, it's not clear to me that uh, most of them would want necessarily to see what I think of as the, as the kind of classical heritage of, of the arts of Ghana. I don't know how interested they are in, um, uh, in, in what, what has come to be thought of as sculpture and, 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 um, and so on. So, uh, but that's in part because uh, the opportunities for learning and exposure haven't been there. Again, the, yes. the, the main museum in, in Accra is not really in super condition. So I think, um, for me, I always, because I have, in, in my life, gained so much from interacting with uh, Italian art or Ming China or, or uh, beautiful uh, uh, calligraphy in Arabic, um, I, I, I'm always thinking, how could we make available to young people, or to people generally, but especially to young people, I think, uh, in, in a place like Ghana, a more, uh, a wider sampling of the possibilities of human creativity. Um, you can think what you like about the, the new Louvre in um, Abu Dhabi. Uh, you can think of what you like about how it came to be and what the background is and, and all that. But going there and thinking uh, how people in Abu Dhabi can take their kids and see uh, Roman, classical Chinese, Greek, uh, uh, Egyptian uh, stuff. They can see fantastic uh, African, just a few, but fantastic African large-scale sculpture. They can see um, great, the early photography, uh, European photography of the 19th century. <laughs> they can see paintings by painters whose names we know, uh, European painters whose paintings we know. They can see contemporary sculpture in, in the sculpture garden outside by, by artists who are still around and alive. Uh, and I would, I, you know, that's wonderful to me. And that should be available, in my view, to everybody everywhere. But most Ghanaians might protest that they don't even have the work from Asante and uh, Fanti and, no. you know, the, 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 you know, they don't have work that, that is local and that they, they look at other parts of the world in which there seems by comparison to be an embarrassment of riches. And that, I mean, do you feel that there are opportunities to recalibrate some of that, to rebalance some of that? Well, too? I, I mean, uh, there are wonderful things from Asante in this building, in the British Museum, yes. on the Museum Insel in Berlin, uh, and, at the, and at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And um, it'd be nice if the standard experience of a, of a Ghanaian museum goer in Ghana included stuff like that, stuff of that quality. There is some stuff of that quality. It's, yes. not, it's not very well displayed at the National University, but National Museum. But still, there is stuff of that quality. So it's, it's not like we don't have anything. And in particular, because some of our art—I mean, I have a particular fondness for reasons that are obvious for gold weights because my mother collected them. And the thing about gold weights is they were not—they're uh, not royal art. Yes. They're the art that was. They, these are these things were made for use by ordinary people, and there's a lot of them. And the reason my mother was able to collect them was because when they stopped being used to weigh gold, because gold dust ceased to be the currency, a lot of the people who owned them lost interest in them yes. because they were interested in them for their function. I mean, they wanted nice ones, but, but they, they had them because they could use them for this function. But there's lots of them left. Uh, and um, so the possibility of, and also that tradition isn't entirely dead because as I said, there are people being making gold yes. weights at the National Cultural Center. And um, you, know, you always think that you knew the last great 
maker in one of these traditions, and there was a wonderful <laughs> guy who, who made fantastic stuff, a man called Kramo, who, which is the tree word for a Muslim, so he was an Asante Muslim, who, um, who, was a, who was a farmer in the farming season, and then, he, and then in, in the off season he made um, beautiful um, lost wax works, which, uh, and he got to know my mother, and so she ended up um, often buying them from him, and she also uh, connected him with a British sculptor named Christine Fox, who went and apprenticed herself to him, and she wrote a wonderful book about his methods and about how, how he actually did it. And he was, of course, he said, well, I'm just passing this on because you know, this is how they've always done it, which is what these people often say. Uh, but he was, in fact, fantastic creative. Some of the things he made, nothing like anything anyone has ever made before. Um, so there is stuff. Uh, and, um, but I agree that uh, in, in a, in a, the, the, there's a special reason for having some of the great Ghanaian art in Ghana. Hmm. It's because Ghanaians have a special connection to it. Hmm. <laughs> it's hmm. as simple as that. Uh, it's, and, but that doesn't mean that, and I, I think most people in Ghana wouldn't say, okay, we want it all back, because they want, they're proud of it. Hmm. So they're glad that some of it's in the, in the great museums. But did, did you see um, Black Panther? There is that moment. Oh, yes. <laughs> Fairly near the beginning of the yes. film, yes. when uh, Eric Killmonger, he walks into a museum which is a barely disguised British museum, and there's the director yes. there, and she shows him a mask, and she suggests it's fuller, and he then corrects her and says, no, actually, yes. it's Wakanda. Yes. And uh, um, she then tells him that, you know, you took this from my people mm -hmm. like you took everything else. Mm. And then when, when I saw that, in the cinema that as he said those words there was a kind of a ripple of mm. applause from across the audience and, and, it, and it, I did feel kind of um, hurt because I mean I've, one of the reasons that I've wanted to work in this particular area is because I wanted to share what I felt was the very best practice with the widest possible audience and I th thought that was a good thing and it's it's painful when you begin to realize that ambiently, this isn't just amongst small groups of professionals, that there is real resentment for some of what. Yes, so we good. Do. I mean, I think, uh, look, there's, we, we, it's important to get, get it right here, right? Mm. Not to go overboard in any one of the many mad directions that you could go. Yeah. So, the gold weights are a good example. They were sold to traders by people who set. The who set the price, and um, the, the, some of it happened in the co colonial context, some of it happened in the post-colonial context, but it wasn't as if anybody was holding a knife to anyone's throat or, or a gun to anyone's head. Um, they, these objects came to be more valued by somebody over here than somebody over there, so they traveled. It may be that the grandchildren of the people over here would like them back. I would like the grand people, grandchildren of the people over here to be rich enough just to go out in the market and buy some <laughs> so, that, so that they can get them back that way. Uh, but so some of it, you know, some, you, you have to do real provenance research. You can't mm. declare everything that came out of Africa mm. to have been stolen. Uh, that, that's condescending to Africans, mm. some of whom sold this stuff because they thought the money they were getting was worth more than the thing that they were selling, often because they could just make another one, uh, as far as they were concerned, because they were, the, the, when these things have ritual functions, from the point of view of the person doing the ritual, what matters is the function. It's not. It's not having any particular one, and if somebody wants a lot of money for this one, there's a guy down the road who makes them, and you can. So I think we've got to be sort of serious. I, I, I reviewed uh, for the New York Review books uh, a book about, uh, well, a book called L'Afrique Fantôme, um, Phantom Africa, which um, was written by by uh, the guy who accompanied one of the great. Uh, collecting expeditions of the French museum system uh, from Dakar to Djibouti. They went across the whole of this, what, the French Sudan, as it were. Um, some stuff in there was stolen. Hmm. They said so in the book. Uh, the, the correct response to theft is to return something to its owner. Yes. But clearly a lot of it was bought. Uh, and um, so I think we, we need to be serious. If we're going to ask a historical question, we, we need to do serious historical work. I, I've been involved a little bit with the, with the, uh, the Humboldt uh, mm. Forum in Berlin, which is um, now sort of the context for the presentation of the German colonial collections. And 
they are committed to, and I'm glad, I'm glad they are, to proper provenance research for everything they own. They yes. want to know how they got it, where it came from. Uh, and, you know, some of these stories are going to be horrible because they yes. have Namibian stuff, and what the Germans did, did in Namibia was appalling. Um, so, um, but we need to know proper, we need to know the truth. And one reason why I don't think you should sort of be in the frame of mind to, I, I, I have this attitude to the Italians. The Italians are constantly trying to get stuff back to Italy, but Italy is crammed full of Italian art. They don't need any more Italian. <laughs> What they need is more Egyptian art. Yes. They need more Chinese art. They need some proper representation of the Muslim world in mm. their very, very Christian museums. So I think um, uh, we don't have enough. And, and one of the reasons, uh, for example, we don't have certain things is because they were taken in punitive expeditions by, by Sir Garnet Woolsey or, <laughs> um, and most people don't know that Baden Powell, the founder of the Boy Scouts, had a splendid visit to my hometown in which he <laughs> destroyed museums and stole stuff. And it's very funny, actually, his account of it, because he says he's describing British soldiers, or soldiers under British orders, some of them were from other parts of Africa, grabbing stuff from rooms. And he says, it's very orderly. They took all this material without any looting. <laughs> and you think, well, <laughs> what, what does he think looting is? Uh, if you're going, so, um, so s there's a horrible, there's a lot of horrible stories and a lot of things were stolen and so on. But, the, but you know, I'm, I think most people in Kumasi who thought about it think that it's great that people in the British Museum can learn how terrific our stuff was. We'd like some of it back, yes. but we don't want it all back because we want people to know about us. Um, mm. So I think um, I, I would like us to, what's, what I feel is great about the present and about the sort of thing you're doing is, we're shifting from a mode of thinking about these things, which is all focused on who owns what, which is very uninteresting, to the question, who has access to what? How, yes. can, we, how can we give everybody a suitably cosmopolitan access to these incredible world treasures? You are looking after, in my view, in this building, you're looking after a portion of humanity's treasures, yes. and you should be looking after it for humanity, not for Washington DC, not for the United States, not for African Americans, not for Africans, yes. but for all of us. And, um, and if, we, if we can get the museums of the world who have these great treasures, there are still treasures out there that aren't in museums, I think that's good. I think it's yes. good that people are living with great art. Uh, but th there's enough <laughs> in the great museums to guarantee most people in the world a pretty good experience if we think carefully about how to share this stuff. But in order to do that, we have to deal with the problem you raised, which is that the institutions for looking after things in much of outside South Africa and, and, and Egypt and Morocco maybe, but I mean, yeah. are not in good shape. Yes. And you simply could not responsibly take one of the world's treasures and put it in a place which may be close to where it came from, but isn't, isn't equipped to look after it. So if, if, I, if, Monsieur, if President Macron wants to do something useful, I suggest that he commits his government to persuading the other governments of Europe uh, to put serious money into building the, 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 the museum homes in Africa for this stuff that he wants to send back, mm -hmm. and that he promises that he will do what the Louvre has done in Abu Dhabi, that he'll, yes, he'll send some of the Malian stuff back to money, but it'll come with a mané. It'll come with some excellent uh, Chinese uh, p painted uh, uh, calligraphy poetry. It'll come so that, p now, it'll take a while to build the audience of these things because people aren't used to this. Yes. Uh, but look, it, it, the British Museum only started doing this a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. Before that, people, most people in England wouldn't have had any idea what to do presented with what's in the British Museum. They wouldn't even have had the idea yes. of a museum. Yeah. They would have had the idea of an art gallery, but they wouldn't, and they would have had the idea of a church, both of which are full of art, but they wouldn't have had the idea of a museum. So I think, um, one, sorry, I'm saying too much, but one thing that I like to remind people of, or tell people if they don't know, is that um, in my hometown, when Sir Garnet Woolsey arrived, there was a large museum and it was there because one of the early 19th century Asante Hinnies heard about the British Museum and said, I want one of those. And it had, and there's a wonderful accounts in the newspapers as it's being looted by these British troops 
of what was in there. And they had Persian rugs, copies of the London Times from 100 years ago, um, of course, some stuff made locally, um, swords, they had uh, the, the, the uniform of a West Indian uh, colonial soldier. I mean, it was a, it was a real, uh, real museum. So uh, it didn't take more than 10 minutes to persuade this Asante Hini that that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, and, um, but then, you know, of course, it was all destroyed and taken away. <laughs> Uh, so I think we can do that. I think we can create a world in which, which is more equal in the sense of access, in the sense of saying to people, art matters to you because it's connected with you, but it also matters to you when it isn't connected to you. Mm. And you will, you, I can, one reason I can appreciate what's so terrific about the Goldwaits is because I have a context for that which includes a lot of other work in metal from a lot of other places. Hmm. And that doesn't make me any less proud of uh, Goldweights. It makes me more proud of Goldweights <laughs> because, because I think we've made a contribution that nobody else has made. Yes. Well, one of the things we're trying to do as an institution to address this is that we are inviting colleagues from across the world, both from across Africa and and Europe and North America to come together to think about how we might deal with this as a single sector. Yes. And there's a kind of a very strange situation in which many museums in the West that one of the biggest challenges they have is of storage because of the sheer yes. size of their collections and the complexity of them. And yet one travels in many parts of Africa and you know they suffer from a Right. Terrible paucity in terms of, of uh, but we have to get to a place in which those that kind of level of exchange is possible. Yes, and so we want to come together as a sector to make proposals to funders so that we can begin to get a yeah. level of equity in terms of provision, and then we can begin to swap expertise yes. to begin to co-develop exhibitions and to begin to build a sector that feels like it is unified by a single set of standards and a single shared feeling that this is something that we're doing together. Yes. And I think that is the thing that led to the instantaneous ripple of applause in that auditorium when we were watching the film, is that feeling that we are somehow doing this to the exclusion of others and almost enjoying the fact that there is yes. such a division in terms of provision, but it is exactly the opposite of that. We are desperate to see greater equality and more sharing. Yes. And in my tenure, we'll do whatever we can to try to make sure that we address and, that. And you will, uh, of course, like the British Museum, you will be constrained by the attitudes of the society around you. Uh, because, among other things, we're in a, this is a government, uh, a quango, as they used to say, in England, a quasi-autonomous, non-governmental organization. <laughs> um, and and this, is, this is, of course, the British Museum's main problem is that, and why um, Neil McGregor was constantly saying to people, I wish you wouldn't talk about ownership, because he could share things with people as long as they didn't say they wanted to own them. And then if he wanted them to own them, uh, he had to get an act of the British Parliament, and you can imagine how easy that would be. So, um, so I think if, if, the, if the sector can think about these things in the right way, it'll be able to create an atmosphere in which uh, it's possible to get, to get the, the stakeholders, which include governments, um, uh, to, to, to understand that this is good for everybody. Yes. Um, uh, uh, so one thing that sh there's a shortage of uh, in... Um, in, uh, in, in, say, London, is kind of mid-level Nigerian art. You can see yes. top level, yes. and you can see what's called tourist art. And I don't use that term disparagingly, but that is stuff made for yes. tourists. Um, but you, and that's a, that's a loss, because you can't interpret, you, you can't interpret El Anatsui, really, yes. Yes. unless you know something 
about the world of Nigeria, and, I mean, he's a Ghanaian, but he mostly worked in Nigeria, um, that he, you know, what are the ref what's, it, what's the context, what the reference is? And, and that, uh, so there are things that people could learn, uh, people who already grasp that there's something interesting about Anatsui yes. could learn if they had a more successfully integrated uh, system uh, sharing with them. Uh, I mean, I like, you know, as I said, I went to this uh, Augustus John show in Salisbury. It's a, it's a minor, a small show by a minor artist. But that's part of one's aesthetic experience, too, is having small shows by minor artists. And there's a whole area of African aesthetic experience that is completely unavailable to people unless institutions like this uh, bring it to them. So I think we can, we can let people see that there's, uh, there's, there's, there's it, it's precisely because it is everybody's. Everybody yes. gets, in, in, uh, even though it's differently related to different people. In the end, it's our human heritage, and everybody's entitled to have access to it. Doesn't mean everybody will want to come. Hmm. So that's fine. But uh, but if somebody you know in in um, Ouagadougou wants to have access, wants to see something of. Um, uh, Quattrocento painting, I think they ought to be able to. Mm. And the only way to do that is to send some of it there because many people in Wagadu can't afford the plane ride to Rome. Um, so I think that's, that's my vision. My vision is of a, of a networked world in which each, each museum is a kind of, it's a site of knowledge and curation and preservation and storage and display. Mm. And, uh, and, but it's all part of a big connected system. And it has to be, it, this won't work unless the system is fundamentally much fairer than it is today. And of course, that's true not just of the aesthetic world, but of, of the world in general, that it would be better if it were uh, a more equal world. And one, one of the wonderful things is that you look at areas like healthcare in Africa where people have really engaged with digital opportunities for yes. trying to really change their healthcare options. And one doesn't wonder if in the future we couldn't begin to deploy some of that ourselves. Because as you say, there may be someone in Ouagadougou, but the technologies and the bandwidth is there. You know, yes. I've stood in the middle of, 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 uh, of, of the desert and in, it, in the Sahara and got you know, five bars on my yes. on my mobile phone, and yes. the ways in which the ways in which people are engaging with those yes. possibilities are utterly yes. innovative and exciting yes. and thrilling. And if we could bring some of that here, and that's what I would love this space to become—a kind of interface onto that mm -hmm. activity, where we can both convey the sorts of things that we are thinking about, but also bring some of that here. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I was uh, for some years on the board of Art Store, which is an organization that exists to take digital representations of artworks and make them available. And part of the project was to make them available to everybody on the planet, in yes. principle, not just to make them available for American universities or British universities. And, and so that the price of access, if you're an African institution, is, is extremely low. Yes. And that's great. And the same is true, I'm now on the board of the New York Public Library, all of our digital collections are not just available to New Yorkers. Yes. If, 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 the, if the intellectual property issues are solved, anybody on the planet can use the New York Public Library to look at anything we've got. Yes. Um, and, I, and so, yeah, there's lots of exciting possibilities in these technologies. And of course, as in all things, this is a place where artists are at the head of, head yes. of the queue to think about how to do these things, making artworks that can be uh, shared across space and time through these new technologies. That's the sort of thing that artists are doing constantly. Yes, yeah, it's an exciting time. We're going to open it up to some, some questions now. Um, if you, um, apologies. It'll come. 
Hi, thank Hi. you very much. Uh, my question would be, uh, what are your thoughts on the virtual art experience, so using new technologies to bring art to different people instead of having the art come to them, bring the art to them? Do you have any ideas on that and how that shapes um, access for disadvantaged people to art? Well, it's, it's certainly, we should do it. That's, that's what something like Art Store does. It allows you to, anybody in the world can look at uh, a Leonardo through Art Store. But, but at least with the current technology, there's something you're not going to get if you don't actually go to a museum and be physically embodied in the same space as the object. There may be objects of which that isn't true, but in general, there's a reason why, yes, we have catalogs and we take them home and we love them, but, um, but they're a kind of memorial of something and the real, the real thing happens when you're in the presence of the object. Now, this is partly because we have a, an aesthetic ideology, which is very widely distributed, and I share it, of, um, the, of the aura. Of the, of the, uh, nothing, what, 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 look, um, you can get to Paris now, I suppose, from New York for what? Uh, I don't know, a few hundred dollars. Uh, and then you have to pay for a hotel. Uh, and then you have to pay for the entrance to the Louvre. And then you can get to see, uh, as many people do, the Mona Lisa. For that money, you could buy a replica of the Mona Lisa, indistinguishable to your eye, because the technology is now that good, why, do, why, do, why are these people wasting their money going to Paris? Well, because they want to be in the presence of the painting. And so do I. I mean, not that particular painting, because it's too crowded and I've seen it before, but, um, you know, there's a difference, in other words. So I, I, that isn't a reason for not doing it, because something is better than nothing. And if your, kids, if your main concern is, as I've alleged, mine is, uh, access, then yes, this is a wonderful, t that's why I, I think, you know, art store is so wonderful. It allows uh, people, uh, uh, if you're uh, at the Cape Town University Art Department, you have access to the same images as, as yes. the guy at the Harvard, uh, in the Harvard Art Department. That's great. I love that. But, um, but if you're going to be an art historian, you're going to have to be in the presence of some, I think, of some actual art. Mm not just pictures of art, not just re-representations. It's like the difference between, I mean, all of us now can listen to performances of, say, you know, Chopin waltzes or Beethoven sonatas that are way, way better than the typical very good performance of those things in, an, in, a, in, a, uh, in a performance in the 19th century. Because we have recordings of them. But does that mean you don't want to go to any concerts? No, you, you want to be in the physical presence of an artist making the music, I think. And, 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 and so the, the auditory experience may be indistinguishable from the auditory experience of sitting in the, in the uh, room, except that you can cough and contribute uh, in the room, but, but you can cough and contribute while you're listening to the DVD uh, or listening to the thing on your phone. So I think, uh, yes, we must take all these advantages as much as we can, but we shouldn't lose track of the fact that, for many of us at least, the object itself, being in the presence of the object, what, what Benjamin called the aura, is it's just part of, the, it's part of what we care about. It's, it's part of what it is to take art seriously. Um, I just wanted to go back to the issue of repatriation, because uh, yes. it's a very interesting one. There is so much debate around it. And it really um, made me think what you said about, because I was more about this idea of returning. Now, hearing from you, this idea actually you're right about having um, major masterpieces around the world is actually a very important element as well. But it comes to the question of uh, about what kind of story we are telling about this object in this museum outside of the sort of original place. I'm thinking of the Benin bronze in the British Museum, which are basically in a basement room, and uh, the story around those objects, it doesn't seem to be very, very well uh, said. So I think there is still the issue. I really appreciate um, the point that you really made me think about it, but 
is still there's still some contentious around who's creating it, who's telling the stories of Absolutely. those objects. Yes, so I mean that's another thing because I said because objects of art are infinitely interpretable, it matters as in all things that they be interpreted by a diverse range of interpreters. And what, uh, what, a, what a Maori artist says about a Maori work um, matters in a special way, even if, it's, even if the Maori artist doesn't have a degree in art history. Uh, because she's probably going to tell us something about what it means to her, and what it means to her, since she's also Maori, is one of the things that I would care about in thinking about the work. So yeah, we've got to be pluralizing who does the interpreting, not because, not because the people from the place have an epistemic privilege. It's not because, as it were, what they know is truer than what the well-informed uh, historian who's actually done the work and, and done the carbon dating knows, um, but because it's a valuable part of, of what needs to be done. I mean, the point about the British Museum and, and the Benin Bronzes, and of course there are Benin Bronzes here, and there are Benin Bronzes in, on the Museum Enzel, and there are a lot of places, um, it, and, in, and in New York, um, is that um, uh, it, 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 if, they're not ad, if they're not interestingly enough displayed there, that's, uh, that's a tiny part of the problem, because the British Museum is full of things that are never going to be displayed at all, because <laughs> it has this vast archive, uh, not, we shouldn't throw them away, even if we're not going to display them, and they're obviously there available for research, which is also an important function of museums. But, um, but I think that in, instead of this kind of... Um, collectors have this impulse. That's fine. They're part of the ecology. But museums shouldn't. <laughs> museums are making the collection, that they should be in the business of making the collection available. Mm. Not of owning it, but of making it available. In order to make it available, you have to own it as a matter of law. But, or well, somebody has to own it as a matter of law, but that doesn't mean that that person is, should be the only person who ever shows it. And so I think, uh, now, look, uh, sending jumbo jets full of art around the world is not very green. Uh, there are, if we had this massive, system of circulation, however, some people wouldn't, some other people could see stuff that they would have had to travel to see at home. So maybe we could actually make it, uh, make it work out even from an ecological point of view. Hello, thank you Hi. so much for both your thoughtful comments and very engaging, dynamic conversations. So my question is a bit of a practical matter. Um, so what is it that, um, in your opinion, we can learn from some of the successes and failures that might have happened recently on a small scale in terms of shared ownership and stewardship, um, and as well, what are the roles that other institutions can play? I say this having in mind uh, observing um, going to museums in Canada and being aware that they've adopted a shared ownership with indigenous communities, um, but I do lack the insight there to see what sort of things um, were successful and what things failed in that context. And I'd really, really love to understand what's energizing about that as we continue to navigate uh, the changing space of art and the mission of having a shared ownership or shared accessibility, if you will. And the other part of it that I also find fascinating is traveling to see museums in Morocco is really, really surprised by uh, some of the active involvement by you know, national banks and other institutions. So I just uh, would love your thoughts on what roles other institutions can play, as well as what we've already been able to learn more recently about um, what, how these initiatives have already taken shape. That's definitely a question for Gus. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think one of the great examples of this is um, is uh, the Elongue project, um, which we've invested in here over a number of years, which is, um, Elongue was a, a photographer who captured um, 
been in um, uh, in a period of real transition and left behind a body of photographs which are utterly exquisite and we as an institution were able to acquire these plates and to share with the people of Benin the body of this work in a way that would not have otherwise been possible. And it's a project which, more than just being about the work, has built a kind of trust, mm. brokered a model of a relationship which will mean that we can deploy further, uh, well, we can engage in other kinds of opportunities to share objects and expertise with those peoples because we've built up that trust mm. over a decade. And I think that it's in that way, that kind of beginning with collaboration around program, working toward acquisition, sh the beginning to share the, um, to begin to share certain sorts of areas of priority as well in terms of the development of institutions that we can really align institutions across the sector in such a way that the feeling of ownership will actually not be, it will be almost mute. It may well be something which is important for legal reasons, but it may not be something which actually encumbers us from actually thinking about how we do what we do. And at the moment, I feel that for a lot of our sector, that there is such a feeling of dissonance, because most in fact, all the people that I work with are people that I have such high regard for, that these are people who are driven to do what they do, mainly because they believe in it. It's a kind of moral imperative that grounds them. And the idea that somehow, we, because we have failed to navigate this historical appalling baggage that we weren't actually responsible for creating, is doubly intolerable and we must now find ways of navigating our way through this so that we can build a sector which is not just equitable but which is more pleasurable to work with it, that we don't have that sense of dissonance. And I think we have, as a generation have the personnel, the belief, we have the resources and the technologies to deliver that and I think that really does thrill me. That makes me feel so excited and the conversations we're going to begin this year and continue next year I'm hoping are just the beginning of making those sorts of changes. So um, you remind, well, something I said reminded me of uh, something that I'm going to get wrong because I don't remember the details exactly but there's a great example here actually from from the museum uh, the, the the Humboldt Forum so the uh, which is connected with the German colonial museums and there's a there's a group in Latin America, uh, some of whose material culture was collected by a German collector in the 19th century. The curator of that work has, has been going back and forth this community. And what's interesting is when the moment of all this talk of repatriation came, they said, oh, no, you, you're doing a good job looking after it. Um, you, you can keep it there, but here's what we would like. And they developed a uh, they wanted to make a movie to explain some of this stuff. They wanted to develop children's books that talked about their culture. And the, sensibly and wisely and, and also justly, that, that's what they did. The, the curator is now part of a relationship between the collections and the people whose ancestors made the objects in which, um, of course, they're acquiring interesting new cultural material out of this as well. But the main sort of motive was to, was to make the people at the other end, the people who's of uh, the culture of origin, feel uh, that they were getting something out of it too. And it turned out that what they wanted wasn't what you might have thought they would have wanted. I, I had the same experience actually, I went to the opening of the Cape Orly Museum, oh, yeah. uh, which is where all the French colonial collections now are. And um, I, I went to a panel, I mean listened, I wasn't on it, uh, to a panel about stuff from the French um, 
uh, from French Polynesia. And the people from there were saying, what we want is to be allowed to come and use these things in the museum. We don't have at the moment, we will, but right now we don't have the places for them. We can't look after them. You're doing a great job of looking after them. We'd like some of them, you may not know this, they said, but some of these objects have the following functions and when certain things happen in our society, we need to be able to commune with the objects. But we don't, we don't have to send them to us. Uh, you just send us a ticket, we'll come, we'll do it here. Again, I mean, so if you are having the right conversations with people, you'll discover what they actually want. Now eventually, of course, they'll want some of it back. And that, as I say, that doesn't worry me. Uh, it's going to worry people who are worried about ownership. If it does go back, it'll still be the case that those people caring about it will want the world to know that they have produced these things. And so they'll want it to travel again, too, eventually. And in a world of circulating material culture, this will be normal, I think. One last question. Um, I'm a lowly economist, so I'm like the opposite of an artist. I'm so embarrassed. But I wanted to get back to this question about why do we value what we value? Um, I'm very fortunate to travel around sub-Saharan Africa from my work, and I'm like the guy from Monty Python. I'm always bidding up objects in <laughs> markets which I think are worth much more than what are being charged. So I don't see... I have, in my 20-year career, no one has ever said, oh, the British Museum should give this back. I'm the one saying it. I would like my African colleagues to say, you know, we, we value these things, we think they're beautiful. How do we think we go, we go about that? A lot has changed, but how do we keep um, basically this conversation about what is worth something, what is beautiful? Because I see a lot of beautiful things that aren't valued. Um, you know, uh, I think judgments, uh, aesthetic judgment is, is bound to be uh, partly relative to a background, a cultural background. I don't think um, there is some, as it were, universal framework against which we can say this is more beautiful than this and this is slightly less beautiful and so on. Um, nor do I think, of course, and I'm sure you don't either, that beauty is the only thing that matters uh, in art. Uh, a lot of art is not beautiful, but very challenging and thought-provoking and so on. Um, what I think is we need a better global conversation in which people talk about what they value in things and in which, uh, well, everybody can talk. The important thing is that other people listen. <laughs> Uh, that's the thing. That's we need to have, again, this is about something like equity, the, the conversational equivalent of equity, is what people say in a museum, in Kumasi, about Kumasi stuff, is an important part of the conversation about that stuff. And it hasn't been treated as an important part of the conversation about that stuff. And, and, and if we had this more cosmopolitan conversation in which we were attending to what other people were saying. First of all, you'd learn possibilities, I think. I mean, just, so just sort of for, an, for an, exa an instance, um, think about what it would take to, to be able to make a judgment about whether Peking opera is worth listening to, right? I mean, it sounds horrible if you're not used to it when you first hear it, I think. That's the main feeling you think. Oh, this sounds like other people screeching. Well. Um, a lot, and you'd have to talk a lot to a lot of Chinese experts and ordinary people to figure out what was going on here. And then if you did figure that out, you'd find yourself probably eventually, it might take a long time and you'd have to learn some languages, <laughs> but you might be able to come to a point of where you could say, I can now tell that this performance is better than that in this tradition. But that, that can take an awful lot of knowledge uh, of a sort that comes from living against the background of, of certain aesthetic practices and so on. Um, my grandparents, either of my grandparents, my Ghanaian grandparents or my British ones, uh, would, would all find some of the things that are perfectly routine in art galleries today puzzling. They would think, why is this in an art gallery? Uh, might be interesting, might not, probably not. But, but why is it here at all? Right? Well, that's because art practice 
has a history and develops and new things come into the sphere of art and whether something's in the sphere of art is or not is is something that's sort of negotiated by communities it's not really negotiated by everybody in the world all at once there are, there are specialist communities of various sorts so I think um, more exposure to more a wider range of stuff for more people in Africa would mean that the conversations the, 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 African voices would enter the conversation in a different way. Um, uh, one of the people who uh, did the restoration of some of the work in the Florence floods uh, in the 80s, was it? Uh, was a Ghanaian guy who was just a, happened to be a great expert on how to restore paintings. Uh, um, his view of those paintings would be extremely interesting to know uh, because he had both the expertise, but also the angle, uh, the, the different angle. So uh, that's my thought. My thought is all of this is, is enriched by, by uh, not by um, looking for a correct answer, but for looking for a conversation in which we share our views, exchange our views about what the correct answer is, knowing that we won't come to consensus, knowing that there will continue forever, there will be people who think that the Mona Lisa uh, is, a, is a not much of a painting. Uh, and, and we won't be able to persuade them. And that's fine. In fact, I would love to talk to some people who think that it's not an interesting painting. I would love to know why, you know, what sorts of things make a painting interesting to them and, and what's wrong with that one. So I think that's, we, it's, it's, it's part of the general idea that if you have a good cosmopolitan conversation around the objects, you share the objects, we respect other people's points of view about the objects, We've got a much better art world that way. Art can play a better role in human life and in, in the interactions between communities if we do it that way. But as, a, as an economist, do you have a, a sense of, you know, your sense of value in terms of the arts? Because, and I find it fascinating that... I buy things that I think will be my environment. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So I think that I value things in a way that the market does not. Um, but I would love, interestingly, I was thinking, I was just in Nairobi, and they're trying to do um, a Maasai brand for the Maasai Mara. This was presented at a conference, and a lot of my colleagues were kind of squeamish. They were like, oh, this is awful, and it's supposed to be lovely, and you go to the Maasai Mara, my, um, many of my African colleagues were like, this is great. Mm -hmm. Any more exposure, um, I think, is I think is great, yes. and I do think there are beautiful things that are just universal. Yeah. Okay, just, we just need to people to value things. So, w one interesting thing about the way in which what we think of as the paradigms of African art have been valued is as a kind of source of spiritual something or other, kind sure. of, and. Um, um, that's, uh, that may make sense for some of them, because some of them were made to do that. But it doesn't, it's not a good general theory of what makes art interesting, that it embodies spiritual power, I think. And, and there's, so another thing we need to, will happen in these more diversified conversations is that people will realize there are lots of ways of valuing um, African art, not just the ones that have dominated uh, in the sort of official discourse about African art. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's lovely and to be here. Thank you. I can't think of a better topic for us to be discussing navigating change and having someone as thoughtful and as um, inventive intellectually as, uh, as Anthony has just been a real pleasure and a privilege to be part of this evening and I am so grateful to you but also grateful to our colleagues at SOAS for this partnership and together you know I think as a partnership I think we can begin to build 
a greater kind of consortium of institutions that do believe in the sorts of things that Anthony was talking about, the kinds of collaboration that will create the sorts of answers that we all would like to see. It's such an exciting time for African art. And, you know, I am so, feel so privileged to work here amongst this glorious group of people. And the sorts of transformations that you will see here if you come back, just the sorts of when possibilities. They come back. Yes, when you come back. <laughs> it's, it is such an exciting time. And, um, you know, thank you, Scott, as well, for introducing us. And thank you all for coming because you are our community. You are why we do this and what makes it really kind of uh, feel like we are gaining traction. We are so grateful to you and um, we look forward to seeing more of you in the future. And please, if you have thoughts about how we can change, improve, how we can begin to make the sorts of changes that we'd all like to see, then please do get in touch. You are so welcome, and um, I look forward to seeing you more again. But thank you, Kwame. Oh, thank you. Thank you.